We are live in YouTube. And we are broadcasting in five, four, three, two. Great, we'll just wait one minute for everybody to join. Great. So thank you all for joining us for uh, the first 2021 session for the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Uh, really special symposium we have this week. Uh, just some quick introductions. My name is Mike Ivan. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at the University of Miami, co-director of our research program and um, specializing in brain tumor and skull base. I'm joined by my co-directors, Dr. Morcos, who's professor and co-chairman of our neurosurgery program, also director of our skull base program and Dr. Komatar, who's a professor and the program director of our residency program. Also, Carolina Benjamin, who's an assistant professor and director of our Keynes lab, which is our skull-based anatomy lab. Mm -hmm. uh, each week, we put the, one of these uh, seminars on, uh, and I couldn't do it without all the help uh, from Sylvester, Comprehensive Cancer Center, University of Miami, and our Department of Neurosurgery. All the administrators uh, have been tremendous help, and, and thank you uh, to them all. Uh, if anybody has more questions about uh, the program or anything you see, you could always find us on social media. We're on Twitter, YouTube, and also this is our website. Uh, you could always find me as well on social media if you have any questions. Uh, so uh, last year we did 32 uh, different uh, symposiums every week, and this year we're changing it up uh, to be once a month. Uh, this is a special uh, week with Dr. Berger, and uh, after that we'll be doing the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, and this is just a teaser for what next month is, which is be starting next uh, week with Dr. Kiyoka joining us from uh, Brigham Williams Hospital to talk about immunotherapy. So be sure to, to turn into that. Uh, but let's get into this week. Um, uh, we have a, a great group of panelists of junior faculty and chief residents. Dr. Zachariah is joining us uh, from Penn State. He's associate professor, director of their neuro-oncology program and uh, director of the brain tumor and skull brain surgery. Dr. D'Amico joins us from Lenox Hill director of their neurosurgery oncology program, and two chief residents, uh, Nitesh Patel, who's a chief resident at Rutgers, aspiring brain tumor surgeon, and, and Dr. Higgins, uh, who's joining us from Columbia University, 
uh, also uh, aspiring brain tumor uh, surgeon, and, and we thank them for their participation today. Uh, this week, very, very special um, for me to introduce our, our keynote speaker, Dr. Berger. Um, he's uh, not only a legend in the brain tumor world, but uh, also has been a great mentor and teacher to me as I was very lucky enough to train underneath him while I was a resident at UCSF, and he continues to help to me as a, I'm a junior faculty. Uh, Dr. Berger, one of the most recognized brain tumor surgeons in the world, and um, really we could fill multiple lectures on all of his achievements and research, um, and so I'll just keep this brief. Uh, he has deep ties to Miami. Uh, he uh, actually went to high school here and played football before he went to Harvard and then returned here to the University of Miami Medical School where he um, started his medical career. So it all started here in Miami for him. Uh, he was actually recently inducted into the Hall of Fame for the University of Miami Medical School, uh, only one of 25 graduates to have done so. After this, he went to UCSF. He did his residency there. Uh, as well as clinical and uh, research fellowships. He also did a pediatric nursery fe fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. He uh, recently finished his tenure of 23 years as the chairman of neurosurgery at UCSF, where the, the long list of accomplishments for both his own research and the department's research is, is just extraordinary. Uh, some of them include uh, the department being the top recipient of NIH research funding for over 20 years, um, also, uh, keeping the reputation scores for the Department of Neurosurgery is one of the top in the world for over his entire tenure. It's just incredible. Uh, he also, during that time, and continues to be the PI for the UCSF SPORE uh, Brain Tumor Program, which is the longest continually funded brain tumor SPORE program in the country. Uh, and the uh, accomplishments out of this program has, have also been uh, extraordinary. Uh, including shaping really our brain tumor culture and foundations that we have it now, such as changing the guidelines for the WHO classification, changing guidelines for new uh, imaging protocols for brain tumors to look for that, uh, prognosis, prognosis and, and diagnosis. Uh, and many of those have been in high impact journals, some of which you see here, but they include Science, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, and JAMA, uh, hundreds of articles. Um, he continues to be the director of the UCSF Brain Tumor Center, as well as the director of the Center for Neurological Injury and Repair, as well as the co-director of the Adult Brain Tumor Surgeon, uh, Surgery Program at UCSF. Beyond UCSF, he also has multiple leadership accomplishments, and just to name a few, includes past president of the AANS, past president of the American Academy of Neurological Surgery, and of the Society for Neurological Oncology, as well as one of the directors for the ABNS. Uh, in addition to all of his accomplishments, his research, surgery, and leadership, he, he leads by example, uh, and I could say so as being one of his residents. He's a, he's a healthcare provider first. He always puts his patients and their families beyond um, everything else that he's doing, and I think that's one of the most important lessons uh, that I've taken out is in addition to all the lessons that I've learned from him. And so I just thank him uh, for taking the time out today to talk to us a little bit about his vast knowledge on awake surgery and educate us on, uh, on this topic. So Dr. Berger, thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Perfect, Dr. You're in the right screen, you're ready to go. Okay, good. Well, before I start, I wanted to thank Mike um, so much for asking me to do this. You know, I've been in the business of training residents for longer than I care to imagine. And one of the most technically gifted, talented residents I ever trained in my life was Mike Ivan. He was just fantastic. I loved having him in our program. Um, I've loved everything about him. He's just a wonderful person and I'm just, Delighted that he still thinks I have something to teach. So, Michael, I appreciate it very much. And I thank you. And the other person I owe a great deal to is Barth Green. Of course, Barth, when I was a medical student in Miami, Barth took me under his wing and took me into his area of interest. And we did some very interesting things with uh, spinal cord injury research way back in the day. But Barth was the driving force for me to get interested in neurosurgery. So I hope he's doing well. And uh, the University of Miami is um, very special in my heart, having grown up near Coconut Grove and uh, 
gone to the medical school there and spent many a spent many a day there on campus. So it's great to be part of this symposium. And you know, I thought what I would do is in the in the time I have, and I'm just going to try to run through this because I think it's it's mostly a story, and I would like to give you this lecture as a story of how I got into this, how things evolved, and the lessons that I've learned along the way. And I should be able to advance it, but I'm not able to. So if somebody can. Yes, doctor, what you need to do, click on the screen, click on the first page on the center, click it one time. Now you can go left or right on the cursor. On the on the arrows on the screen. There you okay. go. Good. So so let me let me just again. The goal of this lecture is to tell it like a story, and I think it's something that um, every resident can embrace in their career. How do you start a process, and where does it lead to? And in the beginning, you know, I was really interested in being a tumor surgeon. And on the other hand, I wanted to figure out a way to do something very, very different. And I was lucky enough to work with George Ogeman, who was an epilepsy surgeon who was beginning to do a lot of very interesting work in language localization. So I decided I would combine these two worlds. But in the very, very beginning, there was nothing in the literature when I went back and looked at how functional imaging and mapping could be used to help you be a more aggressive tumor surgeon in a very risky arena, being as safe as possible. So I realized early on, if I was gonna get into this field that I was gonna to have to sort of carve my own niche as we went along. And that's what this is about. So, where do you learn something like this? I learned as an undergraduate at Harvard, I took courses at the medical school and had the opportunity to come into contact with Norman Geshwin, who was really a phenomenal neuroscientist, neurologist who was interested in language localization. And in fact, he was the one who began to explain to us how different areas of the brain could be potentially linked together in a connectivity strategy, such as in the perisylvian network that allowed us to better understand language organization in the brain. And in fact, he was really the first one that got us to think about the concept of plasticity. And I'll, I'll take you back to plasticity in this lecture, because I wanna show you what keeping your eyes wide open can allow you to do. The other person who was instrumental in our great uh, field of neurosurgery was Wilder Penfield, who really was the first one who mapped the brain with electrical cortical stimulation in the neurosurgical arena. And this is before we had autopsy studies or before we actually had functional localization where everything was really based upon autopsy studies. But yet the, together at Penfield and at the Montreal Neurological Institute, they began a process where they were beginning to describe the different regions of the brain for motor and language function. So the, the work from Penfield was very important. I went back and read this book that Penfield had written to try to understand how he began this journey. Now, at the same time, as Mike Ivan pointed out, I've always had a very strong concern about um, safety in the field. And in fact, when I was president of the WNS, I gave my keynote address on patient safety. And this is a beautiful example of how this technology not only increases extent of resection, but minimizes morbidity. The other thing I realized, and I, I would just tell any of you who are getting into this area is that there is a, a very, very important learning curve 
you could see where I was as a resident looking over the shoulder of my former chair, Charlie Wilson. And in an article I wrote um, not that long ago, uh, we were able to show very, very nicely how even as time went on, I've continued to evolve as a surgeon, as a more efficient surgeon, taking everything in the past, all my experience and moving it forward into the future. So the good news is that even at my stage, I'm still learning, I'm still improving my technique, I'm still becoming a better surgeon. And when that curve starts to deteriorate, then that's when I know it's time to hang it up. But I think as I've shown very recently, that continues to improve. And the other thing that I think it's good to point out, and this is an article that we wrote um, last year and published with a number of senior level people like myself and Hugh Defoe, who was my fellow early on in his career, and Philip DeWitt Hammer and others, how we could take junior faculty members and we could teach them based on what we do and that their learning curve was truncated. It was shortened. In other words, they were getting to be better surgeons sooner than later because it took me a while because I didn't have that mentorship. But now we're able to train our residents how to do this technology, how to use these techniques, how to be safer. And as a result, their extent of resection improves dramatically in a shorter period of time. And that was the basis for writing this article. Okay, so beginning this process, I think the first thing that occurred to me was as I became a more aggressive surgeon, I was seeing clearly in both low grade and high grade tumors, better outcomes for our patients, not just in terms of safety, but in terms of ancillary issues like seizure control, and most importantly, in survival. And I also realized in my career as other strategies evolved, such as intraoperative imaging and ways to use technology to help us define tumor during surgery, that no matter what other technology I applied, I always kept in mind that function was much more important than anatomy. And the point being is that if I'm in the middle of something anatomically and I'm not exactly sure where I am, I rely on function and the mapping of function or lack of mapping of function to get me to where I wanna to go to. So this is a very important concept that you'll see in this talk. Now, the, four, the first lesson that I learned in this whole business early on was that there was tremendous and substantial individual variability in language localization. It was not the case in motor function, sensory function, but language was very different. And even 1500 cases later, having done three of these away cases last week, I realized that everyone remains different. There are no two people I've ever mapped who have the same localization. So individual variability is a critical component of learning this technology, meaning you cannot rely on functional imaging. That's critical. And the other important lesson that I learned early in my career was that if I was gonna do multiple cases as a tumor surgeon, during the day, I had to really think about focused exposures in which as I got smaller and smaller exposures, I realized that a number of these maps were negative. And so the question early in my career was, could I rely on a negative stimulation map and still feel comfortable with the resection? And again, I'll show you how that played itself out. Well, let me just skip ahead to an article that we published with Eddie Chang. Eddie, of course, is the chair now at UCSF, a phenomenal um, surgeon scientist who's done a lot of this mapping with me. And this was a study that we did not that long ago, showing very, very clearly that language is quite variable. And when we look at the scenario with speech arrest, 
versus naming function, you can see the hot spots where you would expect to see stimulation to do speech arrest, but a lot of areas where you might see it and where you may not see it. Just like naming function, you think is always gonna be located in that area back in Geshwin's territory. But the reality is, meaning Wernicke's area, but the reality is this is not often the case. And sometimes we find no naming function in the area of Wernicke's region, but we find it in Broca's area, or we find it way up in the parietal lobe or in the anterior temporal lobe. So the first critical lesson to learn in this business, if you're gonna do mapping, is that you're never gonna find two people who have the same map. Therefore, you have to map each person individually. And the answer to the negative mapping paradigm came in this article that we published, which I still think is probably the most significant article that I've published in my career, because it pointed out that when we put together all the maps cumulatively of these people that we had studied throughout the years, that when we saw an area such as in this region, when I stimulated this area in 100% of circumstances, in this one cubic centimeter, centimeter square area, I could not find any stimulation induced naming or reading dysfunction. Therefore, this points out that if you do a small map and you have negative mapping, you can rely on that data to plan a surgical resection. And the reason I know that this is the case is because when we looked at our post-operative morbidity, we saw very few examples after three months in swelling result of having a permanent deficit. So again, the take home message, even deep into my career now, having done this in over 1500 cases, is that I feel very comfortable saying to a family and to a patient before surgery, that the likelihood of a permanent deficit is acceptably low, right around 2%. And that to me, if you're gonna do awake language surgery, that's the number you have to hit. It's, it's never gonna be zero and it should never be much over two or 3%. And if you're thinking about the right side in left-handed patients who are right hemisphere dominant for language, we know that this pretty much stays the same and that the language variability and localization in these cortical regions is pretty much similar to what we find on the left side in a right-handed person. The other uh, message I wanna send uh, to those of you who are on this um, meeting is that when you do this procedure, you, as I say to the residents, you have to have a stomach for this because postoperatively, when you do rounds on these patients in the first day or two, they look horrible. All of these functions, which are nearly baseline and intact pre-op within days of surgery get worse, and then they get better. So you have to tell patients, like I did today, this morning, when I was on a clinic call, I told many patients, look, in the first few days, there's a 50% chance, if not more, that you're gonna have trouble. Transient issues, but if I do the map and I preserve what I know to be mapped function and leave that alone, it's gonna get better. It may take weeks, it may take months, but as I showed you before in the New England Journal article, three months. If you get to three months and the patient's not getting better, there's a different reason for a permanent deficit, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So in essence, I consider doing glioma surgery with mapping to be the standard of care. In fact, if you want to reduce your morbidity by 50%, you can do so with stimulation mapping if you're removing a glioma. To actually remove a without stimulation mapping anywhere near the perisylvian network is not the standard of care if you don't use stimulation mapping. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. This is an article that I wrote with Hugh Defoe and Philip Whithammer a few years ago 
pointing out how is to reduce the morbidity. And when I wrote this article, Dr. Ivan? I think we lost connection there for a second. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't me. So he did lose connection, okay. Okay, no problem. Um, why don't we go with one of our uh, panelists while we are waiting for Dr. Barger to rejoin us. Uh, Brad or Randy, you guys want to go first? Hey, Mike, how you doing? Good. Brad, are you queued up? You want to go first? Brad, you're muted. Yeah, I'm still muted, Brad. All right, now I'm really back. Um, <laughs> let me share my screen here. Um, again, Mike, thanks for having me. It's good to be back in the new year, kind of doing this again and with a great panel and, a, and a, an amazing speaker and Dr. Berger, you know, um, we've met several times, but, but I've definitely learned a tremendous amount from you just from your videos, from reading your, your books, from reading your articles. And, and it's really kind of shaped, uh, you know, a lot of ways how, how I've kind of learned to do these cases. Um, and so I greatly appreciate your input. So, um, the questions I have are, are, are kind of just these broader questions and I don't want to take up too much time and I'll just kind of go through maybe some cases that either demonstrate these things um, or um, in part um, highlight some of these points. And so um, and then we can get some of the panelists to kind of chime in here while yeah, we're for Dr. Berger too, because that, he might miss the beginning. Yeah. So, so the first one's a case that hasn't been done. So I'd love, love everybody's input. Okay. And this really gets to that question of, you know, where, where do people philosophically stand on, on mapping um, for um, uh, kind of presumptively non-eloquent regions, for non-dominant regions, um, for a kind of higher cognitive function mapping, things that, that Defoe has, has written a lot about, but maybe hasn't quite reached kind of the mainstream, certainly not um, kind of in, in my training or, or, or my practice. So I'd be interested to, to, to know how people fall out on that. So this is a four to five year old gentleman and presented with a first time seizure. He's, he's really intact neurologically, um, some more advanced imaging is pending, but he's got this um, lesion here. So this kind of non-enhancing lesion. Um, and this is kind of this kind of interesting region, this kind of anterodorsal precuneal region. So kind of medially located um, behind um, kind of the, the, the central lobule above occiput. Um, what would people do here? Would people do this awake? You know, I think my gut, I look at this initially and I say, you know, this is one that could be safely done asleep. Um, uh, I'm just curious what people would do, what people would be looking for, what people would map. Um, Defoe writes about this kind of body awareness as being part of, of this region. Um, um, and, and has looked at that in several patients. Doesn't seem like there'd be any real obvious task to map unless you were worried perhaps about maybe some of the deep subcortical language fibers out laterally, but curious what the group would do here. Well, you know, Brad, this is actually an area that I'm, I'm super interested in. Um, I think, you know, training wise, we would have done this asleep with at least you know, uh, phase reversal techniques and maybe subcortical stim in kind of the later days, or that, that's probably what I would do here where we don't have as comprehensive of an awake uh, center. But as we branch out more and more, I think, you know, an awake surgery gives you the opportunity to really at least confirm that your motor function is doing well. But in terms of the more advanced testing, um, it, you know, it, it, it's patient specific and, you know, neuropsych testing specific and advanced. Um, 
I think I remember, you know, in training any, anyway, you know, people with uh, parietal lobe lesions, uh, they wake up different without a doubt. There's some sort of, uh, you know, difference in their affect and their function. And, um, and so I'm leaning towards doing these more awake, especially since we know that extended resection here is going to matter and a, and a super total to the degree that you can safely without compromising someone's lifestyle is going to help and improve, you know, outcomes. Yeah. I would do awake, awake with motor. Now let's just see if Dr. Berger has his, uh, his back. Can you hear us? Back, Dr. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We can hear you. I don't know what happened, but, uh, no worries. Yeah, no problem. I could kind of catch you up. So, so I was just, um, we can maybe just comment on this and then we'll get back to Dr. Berger's talk. Yeah, please. Oh, what, what do you want to do, Mike? You want me to go back to it? Or yeah, not? actually, why don't you just get back yeah. to the talk? Because yeah. I want to make sure yeah. we have enough time to finish yeah, uh, Dr. Berger's talk before we get to the cases. So. Yeah, yeah right. no problem. I'll try yeah. to go back through this. I'm not sure what happened there, but um, no problem. We do have some weather issues out in California, so I'm not sure what the issues are. Okay, so let me let me try to catch up. I assume this is pretty much where you saw me leaving off. Is that correct or no? The slide before this one, I believe. Right yeah. here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna try to rapidly catch up in terms of the technical aspects of it, but the point of this is that uh, a lot of things have changed during the course of operating on these 1500 patients. You know, I've, I've learned a lot about both cortical and subcortical mapping, which can be done very, very nicely, both awake and asleep. And then the different kind of anesthetic routines to use. And early on, you know, there were a number of issues that we were confronted with like age or with the heavy set nature of a patient. And even uh, just to show you how I worked through one of these issues, it was early uh, stimulation induced seizures, which I found if I used very cold uh, irrigation fluid, I was able to abolish the seizure activity during the case, and we published this in the Journal of Neurosurgery, and now this is a technique, meaning the iced ringer solution that's used routinely. And my strategy for these cases is to do the awake, asleep, awake procedure. So I, I start with the patient awake, I then put them to sleep, do the opening with them asleep, wake them up for the mapping. If I wanna do subcortical language mapping, I keep them awake for that part of it, complete the resection, and then put them to sleep. I don't use laryngeal mass very routinely. So that's kind of the, the routine that I've always used. And as far as the, the type of function to map, it really just depends on where you are. And I think Randy was getting to this on his case presentation about whether to do that case awake or asleep, but we can go into that later. But I mean, if there is a function, like if you're worried about apraxia in the right side in a right-handed patient in the parietal lobe, you could do any tasks that they were interested in being um, looked at or tested like playing a guitar or any other, the test that Lorenzo Bella does where he turns the knob to look at fine manual dexterity. You can test any function essentially if you're awake and a lot of a lot of functions on the motor side if you're asleep. I'll come back to that. The anesthetic regimen has evolved into using either propofol or dexamethotomidine and remifentanil. I think the only thing you have to remember is in this setting it's not unusual to change the anesthetic regimen early on before you even make the skin incision. So again, the technique has evolved from very wide exposures you see here to very small exposures like this, focus exposures where you have negative mapping using an anesthetic regimen that works for a given patient. And you see in my experience when I published this article, the need to be flexible over 40% of the time, 
I've had to stop before the skin incision and say, stop the propofol, stop the Remy. Last week, both of the propofol and the dexamethotomidine in one patient made that patient very anxious. And I just did it with local anesthesia and Remy fentanyl. And that works fine. So you just have to understand your patient and what their um, concerns are during the process and adjust to that. Stimulation induced seizures, very unusual now especially since I never use a current more than three to three and a half milliamps using 60 Hertz with a one millisecond pulse duration. You stay with those parameters. This is the classic low frequency technology. If you stay under three, three and a half milliamps, you don't see seizure activity. And as far as the deficits are concerned, again, it's still very, very low around 2% is what I quote all patients and their family members as the permanent risk for a language or motor deficit with mapping these pathways. Now, one of the things that I've used recently that's been very, very helpful is post-operative DTI. Because if I see a patient who has a deficit that doesn't make sense, I like to go back and do a post-operative DTI, reconstruct the tracks to see if indeed I transected any part of a track that's consistent with the deficit, or I should say, and to use diffusion-weighted imaging to look for an ischemic injury to an adjacent area and or to a track. So between DTI and DWI, you can pretty much predict whether a patient's gonna fall into that 3% permanent risk range early on within the first week of surgery if you use those two post-operative tests plus your mapping. Um, I've summarized this recently in an article we published in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology and also reviewed the literature which gives you an idea of where you might fall on the spectrum of deficits. You know, for me, as I said, it's 2%, somewhere around 2 or 3%. Anything higher than that, I think, is too high. And that's based on the techniques that I've used throughout my career. So I feel very comfortable with that morbidity risk at this time. Some of the basic strategies, I talked about the iced ringer solution, which we will use during the course of mapping to prevent spread of seizure activity along the cortex. If the patient's having pain upon opening the bone, you can inject the middle meningeal artery to get control with lidocaine, just do an intradural injection. That helps quite a bit. This is the technique that I use in the operating room in terms of my setup. I don't use intraoperative MRI because you recall from the, one of the first slides I showed you, Function for me has always been more important than anatomy. I'm not so much worried about where I am. It's what the functional aspect of that tissue is that I want to remove or preserve. And only the mapping is going to tell you that. I use some fairly standard paradigms for naming or reading function or for sentence generation, looking for the ventral stream versus the dorsal stream. And in that setting, in the subcortical realm, I've tried a lot of different techniques and methods and tests. And I find, and this was based on a study that I published in Brain and Language um, last year, I find that there are two tests which keep me out of trouble subcortically. So when I am interested in the ventral stream, such as the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, and I don't want to injure that. If I stimulate that, I'm going to see semantic paraphasias for the ventral stream. And I can use this test, which looks to uncouple these words. When you show, for example, if you say to a patient, all right, you tell me if these are related or not. And then you can show a picture of an animal. And then if there's another animal in here, they tell you they're it's related during the stimulation, then you know you're intact, you're not near the ventral stream. But if they are unable to relate this, then you know you're in the ventral stream. But the other way, as I told you, you can look for semantic 
paraphages. Same thing in the dorsal stream. We look for stimulation induced phonological paraphages, or we show these patients a small scene and we get them to tell us exactly what they're doing because stimulating the SLF or the arcuate fasciculus will result in these kind of errors in terms of not being able to recognize this simple scene or stimulation induced phonological paraphages when you're not showing them these pictures. So the bottom line is using naming, reading, sentence generation and picture word interference, I can go through every language function, including the risk of predicting when I'm gonna see a deficit in that function if I injure the ventral or the dorsal stream based on those four tests. Okay, the subcortical mapping, this is how I typically do it, where I stimulate and I resect at the same time. This is an article that I wrote not that long ago with Eddie Chang, which I think is a really good understanding of the relationship of language to the subcortical systems. If you're interested and you wanna read about this further. Okay, well, let's go over some of the indications for using awake craniotomies. We'll see how far we get over the next 10 minutes or so, but essentially it's anywhere, whether it's left or right, anywhere near the perisylvia networks, anywhere near the brainstem um, or the thalamus, anything like that, where you're worried about finding some functional pathway during the course of resection. So just generically, frontal lobe resections, do this awake, temporal lobe resections when you wanna push this back behind the vein of the bay, parietal lobe resections when you wanna go not just cortically, but you wanna go underneath the surface to find the subcortical pathways subserving the SLF and other components of the dorsal stream. And of course the insula, and I'll just show you an example of how you can use this technique to get there but another very, very useful strategy. So take, for example, let's, let's look at a classic awake technique where we would want to use this in the awake setting. And then I'll show you another strategy where we can do um, motor mapping asleep. So in this case, this is um, a zone one, zone four insular tumor based upon my classification of the zone systems. And in this case, this is what I want to achieve. I want to be able to get after this tumor. To do it, you have two ways to do it. You can either split the sylvian fissure, or if you're like me, you're more of a transcortical-based surgeon. I like to go transcortically because many of these tumors are not just in the insula. They've gone up underneath, and they're in the uncinate fasciculus, and they're in other, these other deep pathways that getting just a sylvian split is not gonna be enough. So I never make this decision until I go into the operating room and I see what the function is. So in this case, I had to go above and below the sylvian fissure to do the kind of resection I wanted to do to get to these points. You can see the above and the below resection going underneath through the uncinate fasciculus around the middle cerebral vessels and the lenticular stripe to get to that point. There are other cases I'll show you that I've done transylvian, but this allows you to take these tumors out to do the subcortical mapping and to push it as far back as you need to go to get near these pathways. A sleep motor mapping, in this case, I still do it and I do it primarily because I feel very, very confident combining now not just low frequency stimulation, but high frequency stimulation. I'll show you what I mean by that. <clears throat> so several years ago, I first described the subcortical technique for motor mapping. And I found that at least in that early experience that I still had a risk of a deficit from subcortical injury to the tracks. And I was a little concerned about that. And so as I went through my career, I published this article 
recently, a couple of years ago, with over 700 cases of subcortical mapping because I wanted to really understand what my risk was and could I be better at it. And it turned out that if the essence of this slide was that if I found subcortical function using the bipolar stimulator at low frequency, that meant I was too close to the pathways and I had a 4% risk of a deficit. Whereas if I didn't find the subcortical pathway, I was far enough away that my risk was only 1%. So I decided that this was not as robust of a strategy as I wanted. So I started working with two other ways of doing this and published this in the journal of neurosurgery last May called the triple motor mapping technique where I will use both low frequency and high frequency 500 Hertz stimulation where you know one milliamp travels one millimeter where it doesn't correspond to that with the 60 Hertz low frequency stimulation. So combining these two with transcranial motor stimulation going through the scalp or with a strip electrode has really enabled me to push this resection morbidity down significantly. And in fact, in this article that we published in the first 60 cases of doing this, and now we have just a little bit over 140 cases with triple motor mapping, the morbidity profile, I only had one deficit and it was a four over five deficit. So I was able to troubleshoot these motor pathways in a much more um, detailed fashion if I could use all three of these techniques at once. So I would suggest that the bipolar low frequency stimulation is just simply not as good as doing it with all three techniques. So I'll show you this example. And this is an example where I would use it, just like the example that I think Brad was showing where you take a lesion like this and you put it back into the parietal mesial lobe, not in the cingulate gyrus. I would feel very comfortable in that case doing it asleep with triple motor mapping to interrogate the motor system because I know in that area, at least in that case, I've never seen language function that close to the midline. So whether the lesion's back here or whether it's in front, this is a really good way to do it. So now you've got this exposed, here's the midline, here's the tumor, you've mapped the posterior boundary of the motor cortex. Now you're gonna take out the supplementary motor area and while you're doing that, you're gonna resect, stimulate as you go, do the mapping and push it all the way back into the subcortical system as far back as you can until you've got the resection done, but avoiding the injury to the descending motor tracks that come from the motor cortex because you're constantly stimulating and interrogating that bank of tissue. So, that technique works out very well and you feel very comfortable at this point in time for me doing it asleep. And when I talk to people like Lorenzo Bello, who has, I would say the most experience in the world with motor mapping, he does every case asleep, never does any motor mapping awake anymore. And I basically feel the same way. Having gone back and forth from asleep to awake, motor mapping, finding it too sensitive, and then using a sleep motor mapping and using the trimodal technique to preserve those pathways. Um, that seems to work very, very nicely. And you can see you come all the way back to the motor cortex right here with that technique. And the other thing I learned from the supplementary motor area was that the the ability to predict whether or not you get a supplementary motor syndrome has nothing to do with the Aslan track. So we have an article that's now submitted to the Journal of Neurosurgery with 130 SMA resections. And I wanted to see this far into my career, whether I could really understand the anatomy behind predicting who's gonna get an SMA syndrome. There was some 
talk a few years ago from some of our Japanese colleagues about the Aslan track, which connects the SMA region with Broca's area, that that was the determinant of the SMA syndrome. But I found in cases like this, where I actually transected the Aslan track, that I never saw a supplementary motor syndrome. You can see the case pre and post off. So I think it remains in question. The, the punchline to the article that's gonna come out is the SMA syndrome depends directly, it's proportional to how much of the cingulate gyrus you take out with the SMA. And we come up with a, a really nice volumetric resection which shows when you move into getting an SMA syndrome post-op. Okay, so I'm just gonna show one more thing. It'll take three minutes, Mike, and then we'll stop because I know you have cases, but I just wanna show you on this one slide what this technique has allowed me to do through my career. It's allowed me to ask some really interesting questions like how do you get to a subcortical lesion safely? How do you access difficult to reach areas like the thalamus, like the insula that I just showed you, the concept of plasticity where we've seen in 40% of patients who come back after they have a resection of a low grade glioma, that function moves away from those areas having photographed them initially and at the time of recurrence, the ability to resect lesions that we're told are inoperable based on functional imaging that are not inoperable based on stimulation mapping during the surgery, how to use this to challenge existing dogma. We've written our experience recently and, and actually presented this at the CNS last year about the fact that Broca's area really doesn't exist. It's an area just like the supplementary motor area that when we remove it, we see patients who are either mute or very dysarthric that it returns completely because Turns out Broca's area is a planning portion of the brain, just like the SMA, it plans motor function, it plans speech and removing it does not prevent return of motor speech. And of course, the whole business of extent of resection, which we could spend a whole hour on this, but I'm just gonna briefly show you this one example. And this is, this is the essence, and I'll stop after this. This is the essence of how I've used this technique to define who I am as a tumor surgeon. You have to ask yourself, how do you approach lesions? I approach lesions in the way of a transcortical approach to the equator of the tumor. So you take a tumor like this in the mesial temporal lobe. Some of you may split the sylvian fissure to get there. Some of you may go under the temporal lobe. Some people, some surgeons in the past went under the occipital lobe to get there. But as a very straightforward process for me, I've always taken a tumor, I've made a drawing of the equator and I've connected it to the shortest distance to the surface and said, that's how I'm gonna get there. Now the, the burden is for me to prove that the area I'm gonna go through is not functional. So you take something like this. I wanna to get to this lesion. You might think about coming down the, the Fox or the inner hemispheric fissure, but I'm gonna map this region. And when I find an area that's not functional, I'm gonna go all the way down through a very small cortical window and I'm gonna resect this and I'm gonna map as I go down to do that resection. So for example, you take a thalamic tumor like this, how would you approach it? I'll tell you how I would approach it. I would do a case like this awake. I would go transcortical equatorial into this lesion awake, putting the patient in a lateral decubitus position. Why would I do it that way? Because it's the closest point to the equator of the tumor. I don't have to go on the South Pole and get all the way up to the North Pole and vice versa. So I'm gonna map the supermarginal gyrus. If it's negative, I'm gonna go through it and I'm gonna map all the way down to get into this area and then map the internal capsule 
while I'm doing the resection. And you know, the point is I wanted to do a very aggressive resection. I know that I have residual disease, but I can do this resection transcortically and get the patient in and out of the hospital without a deficit and get a 98% resection of the tumor. So for me, every tumor I ever approach, no matter where it is, is based on a transcortical equatorial approach to the tumor. And I'm writing, you know, the final chapter in my career is I'm writing a textbook now on glioma surgery from the front to the back, just the technical aspects of how you would get to any lesion based upon where it's located, the anatomical issues, the functional images, how do you approach it, and how can you get in and out using this strategy of a transcortical equatorial approach. So Mike, why don't I stop there? That'll leave us some time for your cases and maybe we can get into some of this stuff as we go along. That'd be great. And that, that, was, that, was, our, that was a great uh, talk and thank you again so much. While yeah. we get the, the first case kind of up, which is a couple of questions from the audience here. One was uh, from Brittany Stopa asking about, so what is your role for using functional MRI in preoperative kind of management? Uh, and how do you let it guide you for surgery? And does it ever tell you that the surgery is, is you shouldn't be doing the surgery, it's unresectable? Yeah, it's a good question. And the only time I use it is to localize the motor system. It is really good to localize the motor system because the motor system's hardwired, but I would never, ever not operate on a patient based on fMRI, ever. I don't care what it looks like. I will always take that patient into the OR and interrogate the pathway I wanna go through to get to the lead. Another question was, uh, this is more technical, but when you're doing your cortical and subcortical stimulation, the, the power, the milliamps you're using, uh, do you take into account what you find in the cortical mapping into what you would end up then using in subcortical? Or how do you, how do you change the, the power throughout your, your surgery to kind of optimize the track? Right, uh, so good point. The way I do it is I start with, it's, here's the analogy. If you wanna go into a stadium and go to your seat, you're gonna look at your ticket. It's gonna tell you what section to go to. But so then it's gonna tell you what seat to sit in. If you wanna know where the motor system is within two centimeters, use high frequency stimulation, 500 Hertz, and walk down that pathway from 20 milliamps, 20 millimeters, down. When you get to 10 milliamps or 10 millimeters, then you switch to bipolar low frequency stimulation in which the current density is the greatest between the electrodes. So the current doesn't spread. And if you use six milliamps in the asleep patient on the surface, you're gonna use six milliamps subcortically to take you from 10 millimeters down to about three to five millimeters, that's where you stop. Because if you push it more than three to five millimeters, then you're gonna possibly get into trouble with ischemic injury to the track. You won't cut the track, but you could get a perforated. Um, one other one, I think you talked about briefly, but uh, I'll See, Xavier Mitchell is asking about how seizures during surgery are, are impacted in, in your mapping. I think you talked about treatment of them with ice cold saline, but uh, how does that affect your mapping abilities? Well, it doesn't. If you use the ice cold saline, you can abolish a seizure within typically five seconds, 10 seconds. Then you go right back to it. It doesn't change anything because the patient's not postictal when they have a seizure that brief. However, if you use Ativan or Propofol to abort the seizure, you gotta wait 10, 15, 20 minutes to remap. So just use the cold irrigation, stop the seizure and go right back to it. Okay, great. Let's get to, uh, to Brad's case. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th thanks for that talk, Dr. Berger. There was really, really super informative. I've learned a tremendous amount from you. and. I'm, 
I'm really interested to hear kind of your, your, your thoughts and take on, on your sleep motor mapping. Cause the, the sense I get in, and maybe I'm wrong, but it's, it's become very in vogue to do motor cases awake. Yeah. Um, and I found, I, I think like, it sounds like you found that the sensitivity of doing the motor cases asleep in terms of, of my neuromonitoring team's ability to pick up a subtle um, change in, um, you know, the motor pathway by, by mapping is better asleep than awake. They don't have the artifact from, from some of the muscle tone that you get if you're working in the SMA, maybe getting a false negative um, with the patient having some difficulty moving. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I understand and I've come full circle and just briefly with the triple motor mapping technique, I have found that I can get as close to those pathways as I need to because the monopolar stimulation really walks you down to the danger level, which is 10 millimeters. And then using that current, when you get right up to that pathway, three millimeters, four millimeters, you not only find it with monopolar stimulation, but you can find it with bipolar stimulation. Yeah. So it's a much more sensitive strategy. And if you're using a strip electrode with, or through the scalp with MEPs, you're always interrogating the motor system while you're working. The problem with doing it awake, and I, I, made, I made several mistakes doing it awake because it's so sensitive that you stimulate at a small current and the patient's moving in there you're not getting an accurate information because it's too sensitive a technique when they're asleep. And I didn't realize this until I had this talk with Lorenzo Bello one night over a beer or two, and we were just talking about it. And he was telling me he just would never do it awake anymore because he finds it he just it's too sensitive and you stop too soon. So now I feel very, very comfortable doing it asleep. Now, if you feel strongly about doing it awake, let me give you a little advice. Use the monopolar stimulation. You can still use it, but you got to be careful. You cannot put the return electrode on the forehead. You have to put the return electrode right in your field, in the muscle. Otherwise, the current makes the patient jump too much. So you have to use stickers that go onto the muscle groups and the return electrode is in the muscle or in the scalp, very close to where you are, then you can use these small currents to walk down in the awake setting with monopolar stimulation. But using bipolar stimulation, there's too much current. Yeah. And it, it's too sensitive. Yeah. So, so curious, kind of applied to, to this lesion. This is a kind of a 40 some odd year old gentleman yeah. with first time seizure, neurologically intact, not even from the motor standpoint per se, but but getting to the, the question of kind of mapping non-language um, motor function, the higher kind of cognitive function, how do you decide when that's appropriate, what tasks to use, um, what kind of guides you there? I, I know some people yeah. are kind of everything awake, line by section tasks, things like that. I, I haven't gotten to that point yet. I'm kind of curious how you get there, if you think there's value in that for someplace um, like, like this lesion. Well, I think you can get you can get a little too much into using too many paradigms and get really confused. You just got to look at the area you're working in. So let's just take this lesion, for example. Yeah. This is mesial parietal lobe, dominant hemisphere. There is no language function here, zero. Never seen it. I've written my morbidity with parietal lobe resections. I feel no issue with any language mapping or any, there are no pathways in this area, even if you go this far out. Now, if you start going much further than this flare into this area forward, then you're gonna be worried about the TP portion of the SLF. Then you wanna do it awake, just to map subcortically. But for this language to resect this or this or both, all I'm interested in is the subcortical motor system coming in front of this lesion. And I can test that with the patient asleep. So in this location, no problem. On the right side, if this was on the right side, 
I'd be a little bit more worried about causing some trouble with apraxia. So in that setting, I might keep the patient awake and have them do a manual dexterity test if I was gonna come much further off the midline into that flare. So it just depends where you are, right? In yeah. terms of that function. And if you go back to the article that we wrote in Juro Neuro-Oncology last year, I have a list of all the different functions and locations that can help you think about what it is you want to find or test at that time before you go into surgery. Yeah, that's, that's incredibly helpful. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've kind of been back and forth on this one. So uh, that's yeah. really helpful. Haven't done this one yet, so, so it'll be coming up. Yeah, but I, I understand. I know Randy said he would do it awake. I, I would have no problem with that concept. If you feel more comfortable doing it awake, that's fine. But here's what I want you to understand, is if you take this lesion and you put it up against here, right? This is the termination of the cingulate sulcus, which means that the motor system is in front of this. So you've got a gyrus or two before you have to worry about the subcortical pathway. So if you do it awake, you're not, it's not gonna be too sensitive because you're not right up against it. But if this lesion was over here, meaning if it was in the SMA or the motor area, doing it awake, it's gonna be too sensitive and you're gonna back out before you should. And so I think in this area, if you want to do it awake, it's fine. You don't need to, but you have to be careful. The closer you get and when it's in the motor tract or the motor cortex, it's actually better to do it to sleep. You know, regarding some of the higher order um, kind of neurocognitive function that, that Brad alluded to at the end there, what it, what's your experience with plasticity with lower grade lesions? I mean, I'm assuming this is a lower grade lesion here, and that's where I was. That's what I was really addressing. For motor specifically, I agree with you guys. I think the sleep makes the most sense. But right. the question was originally about the higher order stuff, and my question is, where do you see, or how, in your experience, what is the plasticity like? Is it reliable? Would you see regain of function in these in these tasks? Yeah. So you got to think about that question in two parts. Number one, de novo, what is your ability to predict? whether there has been plasticity to begin with versus doing the mapping, finding plasticity, leaving, a, I mean, finding function, leaving the tumor there or a portion of it coming back years later and looking for plasticity. So in the beginning, it's difficult to predict. In the motor system, I've been relying on TMS or transcortical motor stimulation that we couple with the MSI or with the MRI where we can actually stimulate millimeter by millimeter, co-register that with the MRI and see if the area we're stimulating is functional. If it isn't, then I feel as if that area has developed plasticity and I would go in and map it de novo and look for function or not. I think the more relevant question is, if you operate on somebody and you find function, how do you determine if there's plasticity? You wait several years, you go back in, you can remap it, and then you'll find out if function has moved. There is no diagnostic way right now that we can rely on to tell you whether plasticity has occurred. And I've seen plasticity occur within six months. And then in the article I wrote in JNS, Sometimes we saw it 60 months later. So in a low-grade glioma, you just simply don't know. You just have to go in and map it. You find function, stop, back out, identify where that is, and then you can follow it. And if it grows, you go back in, you remap it. That's the way that whole thing works. Okay, thanks Thank for you. that. Uh, Randy, you want to... Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Brad. I've learned so much from reading everything, you know, that I could possibly read that you and your, your team has published on this. And, and uh, it's contributed immensely to how I think about these things and how I practice myself, without a doubt. Um, one thing that I've been doing, you know, I, I started here at Lennox Hill and um, the AWAKE program here is is probably, you know, it, it it's growing in its sophistication. And I've heard you guys talk and I've heard uh, Naderson and I talk about growing these programs and, and we're working on it. And 
we're gaining experience and we're growing. And one thing that we have um, done differently though is, you know, there are limitations. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Hold on one second. Obviously in terms of what you can do with awake mapping. So understanding that it is the gold standard and understanding that everything you're saying is appropriate. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we've been looking at, at as a surrogate or a possible surrogate is a sleep speech mapping when able. And this is kind of a, a newer technique and it's using oral facial muscles as surrogates for motor speech. And this is really in patients who cannot tolerate awake when all of a sudden you have those limitations. And, you know, I think that we've all encountered those patients sorry, where uh, they're unable to tolerate awake for whatever reason, psychiatric disease, their altered mental status, they have some sort of cognitive delay or language delay from the tumor itself, um, significant comorbidities, maybe they're obese with sleep apnea, um, age issues, or, or more commonly or more realistically language barriers. Um, this patient in the first slide uh, only spoke Mandarin um, exclusively, and we didn't have a translator associated with it. And so what we've been looking at is using uh, these orofacial muscles as surrogates and, and understanding that we aren't able to map you know, the more complex or higher order language functions. This is specifically related to frontal, you know, inferior frontal lobe lesions. And so what we do here is direct cortical mapping um, using a multimodal approach, kind of like what you discussed. So we have SSCPs, we have transcranial motor evoked potentials, we have cortical bulbar motor evoked potentials. And what I'm showing here in the image is kind of the novel things. So, you know, we use an ET tube with bilateral um, vocalis uh, recording. We use contralateral orus and mentalis, we use contralateral tongue, and we use bilateral cricothyroid. And then we use obviously a phase reversal and a direct cortical stem technique. And what we do is we find phase reversal and we use a one by six electrode, you know, standard stuff. And we use multipole stimulation to, I, to really stimulate motor tracks that we found via phase reversal. If we find a uh, compound muscle action potential, we reduce our stimulation. Um, to ensure that we're not getting spread. Obviously we want central activation. And then once we get a nice, you know, uh, you know repeatable, uh, robust response, we reduce our stimulation to a submaximal component. Then we use a monopolar and we stimulate areas for planned cordycectomy. And, you know, we increase one milliamp at a, t at a time basically to reduce false negatives as we go through. And our experience is, is small and we're looking at this, um, but I, I think it's meaningful to a degree. It's not perfect without a doubt, but when you're left with no other options, it allows you to get you know, close. It allows you to plan your cortisectomy at least. Um, the trouble is obviously is, is our, um, our controls here. We don't, we don't have one yet where we've uh, stimulated something and taken it and then caused a problem because obviously you know, we, we would run into problems with that. Um, but we've seen positive impact. And so my question to you is, you know, what do you, what do you think about something like this with your experience? This is, you know, obviously me young in my career, trying to think about ways to, you know, circumvent some of these issues that we have. Um, here, I'm going to stop sharing, or I don't know if I did yet, yeah, but uh, yeah. just, just your thoughts in general. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is the kind of thing that we should all be doing is looking at new ways to do things. No question. It's just like, can you use resting state as a surrogate for language localization, like Eric Luthard is trying without actually doing intraoperative mapping. I mean, we don't know, we gotta try. You don't know, you have to try. Yeah. I think a couple of caveats here. One is, of course, when the patient's asleep, you eliminate the ability to do any subcortical interrogation of the descending tracks, which as you know, is so critically important in taking out a tumor like this. So that's one thing. I think the other thing is that like we showed with Broca's area, when I routinely get speech arrest or face motor cortex on the dominant side, I was doing this case last week where that happened. I had no question about removing that area. I know I'm gonna get a facial group contralaterally that'll get better, but I was able with the patient awake to stimulate the subcortical systems and know when to say when, when to stop. So um, I would feel, personally, I would feel uncomfortable with using it as a surrogate just because I would be worried about the subcortical system, Randy. I think that to me would be my concern. 
Now, again, I, I think you need to do this. You need to keep trying it. You need to keep track of your morbidity and the recovery profile of your morbidity. And if you can show for those kind of lesions that it's equally effective, then great. Then, then we need to know that. We need to change our ways of doing it. But you know, in a patient, I just want you to also be careful with the idea that patients can't tolerate awake procedures. And you and I both know that there are those patients who really, really, really can't tolerate it. But all of those patients, like, you know, the Mandarin patient, you've got to find a Mandarin translator. Yeah. If the patient's sure. anxious, you know, I just pre-medicate them with Ativan and stuff. Their speech is a little slower, but you get, them through, you get the drift. You just, because it's easy if you find this or that, which makes you back off. But the better way to do it is to, you know, just say, I'm going to do these cases awake. I'm not going to not do them awake and find a way to do it. But again, for those cases, like when I looked at that case, I said to myself, wow, that's a lot of mass effect. I don't know if I'd want to do the patient awake because of the mass effect and not hyperventilating. But the other way I would do it is I would either do one of two things. I'd either take the patient into the OR, open it up, brain swelling, get a quick map, put in an LMA, hyperventilate, take it out, or intubate them first, do one stage procedure, go in, internally decompress it, get them out of trouble, wake them up, bring them back two days later, do it awake. So you, you just gotta try to troubleshoot it you know, to the point of saying, I'm going to do it awake until proven otherwise, or, you know. And, and just to point out the other part of Randy too, is the other, uh, you know, these, these patients that come in, they're already losing their language. You know, another uh, Dr. Berger move uh, that I always found useful is admitting the patient a couple of days beforehand, drying them out, giving them some mannitol. And, you know, when I first started doing that here, people were just like, what are you doing? Like the patient's speech is no good. Like you're not going to be able to do it awake, but you could really find out a lot in those one or two days when the patient's in the hospital and you optimize them with steroids and mannitol. And, and, and if they improve, you could definitely, I've seen multiple times changing a patient from a poor verbal, poor language patient into something that you could map. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Agree. Thanks so much. Very, very insightful. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, Natasha, Natasha, you want to go next? Sure. Just give me one second. You guys uh, see my screen? Yes, that looks good. Uh, Dr. Berger, thank you so much. Um, that was a phenomenal talk, very inspiring for uh, someone as myself who's sort of in the infancy of my neurosurgical career. I'm a neurosurgery resident here at Rutgers, and um, I have a case that um, I actually had done with Dr. Hamp. Dr. Hamp is now at Westchester, um, but he was a former Rutgers attending for about a decade. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through some slides and just have some very basic questions. So you have a 25 year old female um, who around I think it was around 2018 or so, had a, about a year of intermittent right arm and facial twitching. Um, her symptoms were sort of on and off, went to her primary care provider and took some time to get a workup. Um, after conservative management, eventually did get an MRI, uh, which noted a left frontal abnormality. Uh, no other deficits on exam and no other significant history. Again, she was young and healthy otherwise. I'm just gonna stick to the key relevant images of an axial flare MR here. And mm -hmm. I'll just sort of fast forward. to sort of this area here. Um, and then I have some stills as well on the next slide to stop. Um, so there's a contrast image on the left and uh, the, the same flare image I showed earlier. Yeah. So we sort of looked at this initially and we thought this is sort of anterior to the hand motor area, not necessarily in the motor strip itself. And, you know, before I go further, you know, Dr. Hanson and I sort of talked about this and, you know, we sort of thought, would you do this sort of awake just based on location alone? What are your thoughts on something like that? Um, but without any further imaging at this point. Yeah, well, one, one um, image that's very, very helpful in making that decision is a coronal image because this lesion is, I think if you look at it on the coronal image, you'll see it's in the middle frontal gyrus. And actually we have a, 
a paper that was submitted to JNS recently as well with about 40 some odd awake resections of middle frontal gyral gliomas and what the morbidity profile is with that. And it turns out that if you have a lesion in the superior frontal gyrus, which this is not in, then it's more of an issue with the supplementary motor area that we just talked about. In the middle frontal gyrus, you do have to do this awake to map language function. You don't necessarily need to do it because of the motor system, but you know, you need to do it because of the language pathways. Because remember what you want to do. You want to get this tumor out. You want to try to get a margin around it. So you're going to be going very close to the top portion of the lateral frontal gyrus, meaning the operculum. It's going to, again, I can't see it on the coronal, but you're going to go down to that area because you want to get a margin. So you have to map language function here. And while you're there, you can very nicely map cortical and subcortical motor function. But to answer your question, the cutoff is if I see a lesion on the other side of that sulcus superiorly towards the falx, I do that with the patient asleep. And I counsel them about the SMA syndrome based on the study we have about to publish. If I see it on the other side of that sulcus in the middle frontal gyrus, I do with the patient awake because of the potential risk there um, for language function. So that's, that's the answer. Um, thank you. Um, so we ended up getting a, a functional MR, uh, one, she was younger and, you know, we wanted to sort of try to cater the resection uh, to be as best as possible. Um, and I'll sort of go through this just for simplicity's sake, purple and green sort of represent um, uh, areas that were active during speech exercises. And there's an axial and then followed by a coronal, which I'll show both. And we can see, you know, on the same image, uh, sort of these areas that were activated during speech exercise were sort of flanking the lesion on both sides. And here's actually a, the coronal um, view that you mm -hmm. commented on before. Uh, and just as you said, um, you know, again, you can see these green and purple areas mm -hmm. um, into that. Right. Um, so based on that, you know, we sort of looked at this image and we sort of changed our approach. We initially, again, I said that we thought about doing this sleep um, and thought we could navigate and just do, you know, cortical stim and try to get it that way. But um, we sort of chose to do this awake um, after this fMRI and we changed our approach. Um, so, you know, with that, you know, I just, some questions you've already answered in your talk, but if you could sort of, uh, you know, spin them in the relevance of this case. Uh, thoughts on secondary language areas. You know, we had a tumor talk with the Journal of Oncology and Randy's on there with us a few months ago. Where we talked about age of acquisition and language representation and how it sort of can be in multiple areas, not just what we traditionally think of. Um, how do these things affect your own surgical planning? Um, also things as, as you were sort of touched on, I think you were talking about SMA areas and or even laryngeal motor. Uh, other things, just sort of nuances. Um, and then the most I guess the, 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 more, the more important question was guiding depth of resection. Um, just one side note, we had noticed um, areas of speech arrest as we stimmed around this lesion that corresponded to the fMRI. Yeah, so, well, principle number, number one, never rely on the functional imaging to decide whether you do awake or asleep. I think, you know, if there's, if there's one thing you remember from this talk, that's the one lesson I can share with you that's stood the test of time. And as you get older and you do more cases, you'll come to realize that that's exactly the case. Secondly, um, as far as secondary language is concerned, I mean, in general, I always ask the patient when they learn their secondary language, if they learned it after the age of adolescence, it's very unlikely to be in different locations. If they learn it early on before adolescence, then I always map each language separately, always. That's pretty much the rule of thumb. I've never regretted not mapping, you know, the secondary language in somebody who's 26 who learned their language in college, second language, because they always overlap for the most part. So 
bottom line is if somebody learns their second language early on in life before adolescence, I think it's worth doing each language for naming, reading, etc. That's very key. And as far as the subcortical system, you know, getting speech arrest when you're removing something near the supplementary, or not a supplementary one, but when you get speech, let, let's go back for a minute. If you're awake in the SMA region in the dominant hemisphere, you can get speech arrest from stimulating the Aslan tract. But remember what I told you, removing the Aslan tract will not give you an SMA syndrome. It's a different reason. Likewise, if you stimulate underneath the middle frontal gyrus, it is not unusual to see some alteration of motor speech, whether that's because there's some ancillary pathway from the frontal operculum up to that area that causes that, or whether you're actually getting subtle face or pharyngeal movements because you're too close to the face motor cortex, it really doesn't matter. But the way you have to tease that out is you have to make sure somebody's looking at the patient and they're not having pharyngeal movements because if they are, that's a motor function and you can remove that because the face motor cortex and the pharynx motor cortex and subcortical region is bilaterally innervated. You have to stop at the thumb. Anything above the thumb, meaning in the throat, lips, tongue, face can be removed. So if you get speech arrest and you're seeing movement of the pharynx, it's okay, you can remove that. They'll get a facial droop, they'll have some dysarthry and then it'll get better. Um, but if it's down near Broca's area and you're getting speech arrest without pharyngeal movement, you can always resect that. Again, it's a planning station. So you're going to get post-operative hesitancy, you're gonna get post-operative dysarthria, but it will come back because it's a planning area, just like the SMA is. Thank you. Um, so just very quick post-operative images, um, just our initial yeah. pulse up. And we actually just saw her back in November and um, here's her follow-up MR. Uh, sure. The path came back all ago, just uh, grade two at the time. But let me just that. comment on this case and the case I think Randy showed Excellent resections. You guys are doing great. I mean, at, at your stage, I wasn't doing resections like this. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm serious. And it, it goes to that paper we wrote last year and published that if you have mentors that are teaching you how to do this, you feel more confident early in your stage, you can get a better extent of resection. This is a perfect example of what you and Randy showed, um, I think, you know, of being more aggressive, safer early on in your career. It's great. I love to see it. Thank you. Just doing what you told us we could do. <laughs> well, but you believe in yourself. And remember, I didn't have that person telling me. Yeah. So I didn't, I had to go bit by bit by bit. My, the resections I did in the first five to eight years of my career were really embarrassing. When I went back and looked at him, but it was a painful experience, but it was a great learning experience to go back and look at why I stopped. And I kept saying, okay, next time I'm gonna go further and further. So now that's why I'm on that part of the curve. So yeah. you guys are already there and you're gonna get better and better, which is great. Okay, uh, Dom, you have, if, if Dr. Burger has three more minutes, we have the last case. Go right, ahead, uh, yeah. And I uh, just want to thank Mike and Rick and the Miami team for giving us a chance to be on the panel and Dr. Berger for your insights. Uh, this will be uh, interesting to get your thoughts. And there's a case I did earlier this year with Dr. McCann, uh, we're one of the chief residents of Columbia. Uh, it's a 65 year old uh, right-handed gentleman with a, uh, essentially a low grade lesion in the right, uh, primarily middle temporal gyrus, lateral neocortical uh, presented with seizures. Um, Pretty straightforward at face value, but the uh, caveat is that he's a pretty prominent uh, music uh, composer, and he's very worried about uh, losing his ability to to um, continue this after after surgery and award-winning films, uh, etc. Um, so 
uh, I wonder if, before I go into what we did, I just wonder if you have any thoughts off the bat in terms of uh, any awake accommodations that you would do or have done or seen any issues with musicians who've had uh, surgery in, in this region in the past and any issues uh, post-operatively? Right, so if this is where it's located and only in this area in a right-handed person who composes music, I, I would not hesitate to do this asleep because I've never seen basically in a praxia, meaning a, in a, a loss of the ability to do something that they normally could do, whether it's you know addressing apraxia or physical apraxia or whether it's some cognitive apraxia. I haven't seen it from this location. What Guy has shown uh, in the past is when you resect things in this area on this side, some patients have inability well, they have prosopagognosia, which is the inability to recognize uh, faces. I have never seen that until I did a case recently that's so unusual. It's in the mid part of the parahippocampal gyrus on the right side of the right-handed person. And she developed the prosopagognosia and Post-operative DTI did not show any violation of the ILF, which is what causes reading dysfunction, or we think loss of the ability to recognize famous faces. Anyway, I've never seen it. So I wouldn't have a problem resecting this. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what we kind of told him. There's a low risk of any issues post-operatively with his ability and uh, going through some of the literature, you've it kind of mentioned your, your studies on right dominant patients and Dr. Defoe is a big proponent of awake surgeries. There is a small amount of literature on amusia and it's primarily uh, right uh, superior temporal gyrus is the uh, conclusions from Dr. Bruce here at Columbia looking at a series of stroke patients and MRI studies. Uh, so we actually ended up doing it awake um, and uh, we came up with a mapping strategy with the neuropsych uh, group with uh, him planning out a series of increasingly complex uh, chords and composing uh, pieces and he would listen, play, uh, and then check for accuracy. And you could see the kind of awkward position from a, a seated uh, awake temporal uh, surgery, see Dr. McCann here. Um, and uh, let's see a short clip here of, of the mapping strategy where he would listen for the cues, play visual or audio and then we confirm the accuracy and then we do stimulation with the ojimin uh, while he was playing to see if there was any uh, interop errors and uh, that all mapped out to the uh, MTG and STG were all negative. So we were able to get a good resection and uh, he's doing well and back to composing. So it's uh, so a rare case. I think he would have been fine asleep, but it, it, I think it gave everyone peace of mind and, um, and he, he did well afterwards. Well, and here's the beauty of the technique is that you can't, make a wrong decision in a case like this. If you yeah. want to do it asleep, great. If you want to do it awake, great. You don't have to, but you cannot make a wrong decision for this case doing it awake. So I wouldn't have done it awake, but that's my decision, but doing it awake is perfectly fine. And before we, I had a follow up question for your, when you stage the, uh, the cases that you want to do with some debulking beforehand uh, in the, if it's like a high grade glioma, do you get into trouble with a uh, hemostasis and trying to, to exit the first stage of the case? And if so, what do you, what do you do at that point? Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes of course, you know, when you, when you bite a tiger in the ass, <laughs> you know, sometimes it bites you back. <laughs> and one of the problems with taking little pieces of, really vascular high-grade tumors is that it's going to bleed in the middle of the night. So it, yeah. it's, so what you have to do in that case, Tom, is you just got to get in that thing and you got to get, you got to get the vast majority of that inside stuff out because it's really at the margin that you're really interested in doing the math. Okay. So you get them decompressed, you get a lot of that stuff out of there, then you go back in. Yeah. Chances are you'll be okay. But if you see bleeding and you, you know, you just got to keep going until you get it stopped and then try not to violate the margin. 
yeah. save that for the awake part. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, we're past 6.30 and, and those were phenomenal cases and an amazing talk by Dr. Berger. I just want to thank him again for his time and, and uh, answering all the questions that we had tonight. It was really, I think we all learned something, uh, no question about that. And uh, we'll continue to learn from you and, and we thank you for yeah. all that. Well, I learned, I learned a bunch from all of you folks too. So it's, it's equally gratifying to me because I still learn at my stage and you will too. So have fun doing it and uh, remember, remember why we're all here. We're all here for one reason, that is take care of patients and do the right thing for them. And um, that puts the onus on you to do it, but you keep doing it and you'll, you'll do it right as you will see over time. So don't be intimidated, just be smart, be safe, and remember, there is a patient at the end of that spectrum who's going to have to live with whatever you do. So make sure you use all your skills and care to do it right. Anyway, Thank on that note. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks good evening to the East Coast and beyond. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike.